I'm Rob Trasinski. This is Salon of the Refused, where we talk about ideas that are outside the mainstream. My guest today is Tom Nichols, a professor at the War College and Harvard, uh, probably best known as the author of The Death of Expertise. Uh, thanks for coming on, Tom. Thanks for having me, Rob. Good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, now, I mentioned you're, you're probably best, best known as the author of the book, The Death of Expertise, and I want you to sort of describe briefly what, what the thesis of that is, what, what the phenomenon is that you're describing. Well, the short version is uh, it's not, uh, I, I always, these days I always kind of start about what it's not about. It's not about people not liking intellectuals. That's, right. that's a problem as old as time. Uh, it's about something that has been growing since the 1970s, roughly, about people thinking they're smarter than experts. Not distrusting experts or wanting second opinions, but the kind of problem where somebody walks in to, you know, their doctor, that's the classic example, and says, uh, here's what I have, here's what you're going to do. Or, you know, telling their lawyer, well, you know, I, I've read a few things. I, I saw a few things on TV. I saw Perry Mason once. <laughs> uh, and then explaining the law to a lawyer. And it, it, although people think it, it initially that uh, this was reaction to social media, as I wrote the book, I found that this was actually becoming uh, uh, a global trend and uh, had been around for a while, even before the Internet. So it was about really in the end whether we can sustain a republic whether we can sustain a modern division of labor both economically and politically especially politically when people won't listen to each other and won't take each other's advice about things from you know carpentry to nuclear physics well i think when it comes to the application of this to politics though the obvious objection is basically haven't the experts screwed up can't you come up with a whole bunch of different ways and, and maybe not so much in nuclear physics, but more or, or in medicine, but much more frequently in politics where people who claimed to be experts, uh, you know, Obamacare, for example, was drafted by a bunch of experts. Uh, and it's so bad that now I have in, in on Twitter and other places, I have Democrats campaigning against Obamacare. It was so terrible. We need Medicare for all to solve all the problems. So what about the track record of expertise, particularly in politics? Uh, well, first, let me back up and say people really are doing that about nuclear physics <laughs> and medicine. I mean, you know, people are going and saying, you doctors didn't know anything about it. Somebody sent me an email. It's one of my, I, I keep the greatest hits saying the thing about eggs proves that doctors don't. And the person literally said to me, it's proof that doctors don't know anything about heart disease. Um, What's the you thing know, about yeah. eggs? I mean, that they said cholesterol uh, was bad and yeah. eggs and then eggs were OK. I mean, I even gave my own doctor hell about this, you know, mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. kind of thought, and he went, yeah, you know, and, yeah, we got that one wrong. Uh, but um, turns out eggs aren't poison. But that doesn't mean doctors don't know anything about uh, heart disease. But your your point about politics is a really important one. And in the book, I, I stress the difference between political elites and experts, because uh, Part of the problem, I think, with politics is that experts uh, actually aren't that much in control as people think they are. Uh, that our advice gets taken. You know, I was a. I should also point out for people who don't know my background, I was an expert advisor to a U.S. senator. I, I was his uh, personal staff for foreign and defense affairs. And you know, we get things wrong. Don't let me just say there's a whole chapter in the book called "When Experts Are Wrong." Yeah. Uh, because we will get things wrong. Uh, but I think with most major programs, what you get is an expert idea and then a kind of game of telephone that at the other end, something plops out as policy that represents all the compromises and all the log rolling and all the other stuff that mostly people want. I mean, I've had people on the road get mad at me uh, because they said, well, you know, the problem is Washington doesn't, Washington doesn't listen to us enough. And I always come back with the challenge that perhaps Washington listens to you too much. That part of the reason Obamacare is such a, a, a hot mess is people calling their congressperson and saying, look, I want you to repeal Obamacare. And the congressman says, yep. And then they say, but I want you to keep the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> well, oh, okay, we can do that. Um, you know, that's, if you really want that, we'll figure out some way to build this, you know, push me, pull you, uh, and, and, you know, in a, in a sense, you get what comes out of it. Why do people, the same people who claim to hate defense spending, you know, never want that defense spending cut in their district? 
um, there, years ago after the Cold War. We had a base closure task force that said, we need to look at, you know, we don't need 100 bomber bases and missile bases and all that other stuff to fight the Soviet Union. Uh, and there were experts, including political leaders, as well as defense experts, and they came up with all kinds, this was a good, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And um, suddenly people said, well, now wait a minute, you crazy experts, don't be, that's, that's a nutty idea to close my Air Force base. Right. And, and so I, I'm just gonna throw this back onto the public to, to some extent. Now, with that said, um, you, you will get colossal failures, like the director of the CIA walking and telling the president, slam dunk. WMD in Iraq, slam dunk. Well, it wasn't a slam dunk. Um, and that was expertise becoming politicized. That was expertise trying to not speak truth to power, but to tell power what power wanted to hear. And we're human beings. We fall prey to all of those, uh, all of those faults and weaknesses like other people. I, I guess what I'd say is even in politics and political affairs, we can be wrong. We're just less likely to be wrong than the average person is. So I think one thing we have to recognize, though, is that there was a role of the left. Now, we talk about the right. I think today you sort of think of as the ones being the populists who don't want to listen to the experts. But I think there was a role that the left had in sort of discrediting expertise in that you had the whole sort of progressive dream under under uh, Wilson was we're going to have rule by impartial experts and managerial experts who will you know plan everything out. Uh, for for the good of everyone, and there's a lot of uh, record of failure on that sort of experts as the central planners of everything. Or one example is Cass Sunstein, who wanted to do all the nudging in the <laughs> or, Obama or the administration, Soviet Union. <laughs> or the Soviet or, Union, yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, it, it, I would actually even put uh, a bigger burden on the left here. Uh, because there were two things that happened at the same time. One was this notion that, you know, uh, wise experts would simply, you know, sit down with the central planning charts and we would avoid all those <clears throat> Soviet mistakes and we would do it the right way. There's a great line in um, Donald Fagan's song, The New Frontier, uh, just machines to make big decisions programmed by fellows with compassion and vision. Yeah, uh, which is a great line. And that is, you know, the, the progressive dream of the 50s and 60s gone wrong. Uh, the other thing that happened was that in academic institutions, um, people on the left were leading the charge toward postmodernism, which right. basically said, well, you know, the truth is what you think it is. It's what you bring to it. The text says what what whatever you think the text says to you. Uh, um, you know, please don't everybody at me about postmodernism. I know it's more complex than that. But in the end, um, especially for students who are new to it, it comes across as the truth is what you think it is. With all that said, I'm still going to defend the technocratic advent uh, of the modern society in the 50s and 60s by pointing out that things that people want in a modern society, like clean water and stable um, diplomatic relations that make their passports valid um, and you know a whole bunch of other things that you don't think about every day requires large cadres of technocratic elites in everything from politics to stem fields uh, so to some extent pinning this on the left is disingenuous because some of it was just unavoidable right. that we were going to have large numbers of technocrats and bureaucrats and specialists doing things that we just expect to get done on a daily basis. So what, what you're basically saying is there's a version here of that, that scene from Monty Python's Life of Brian, the, the what have the Romans ever done for us scene. Right? Yes. You know, what have the experts ever done for us aside from <laughs> you know clean water and, and, and uh, medicine and right. you know, everything else, right? From, from Donald Fagan to Monty Python, and it's true uh, that you know the, the uh, people say, well, you know, the average, they ought to listen to me. I'm the average guy. I have a lot of, I mean, this was, um, um, I guess this is where I should remind everybody, I don't speak for the government or the Navy or anybody else or Harvard Extension School, which is where I actually teach, um, uh, that, you know, the president really made, got a lot of mileage out of this, that, you know, these elites and, and the Brexiteers, the leavers, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, of, you know, these elites are just telling you what to do and they're trying to run your life. And people weren't okay with that um, in, uh, on some issues, but forget how okay they are with it on a million other things that happen around them uh, every day. So I, 
And my big concern, let me just uh, kind of throw this out there, because my big concern about how democracy will fail with this is really not mob rule. I know I come across that way in a lot of conversations and parts of the book that I'm worried that, you know, the rabble is going to burn down all the libraries and all that stuff. I actually don't worry about that as much as I do about the fact uh, that technocrats and specialists will simply say, you know, things have to work. The lights have to go on. Um, air travel has to happen. Embassies have to be staffed. And so, you know, we'll just stop asking people. Well, um, we just we just won't we just won't bother with that whole middle step of democracy, and we'll just kind of get things done. Well, well, that does lead me to I think Brexit is an example where I'm more sympathetic to the Brexit side because I think you had this case where there was the idea that we should have a European Union, we should have experts in Brussels, but they didn't leave and they didn't make it democratic enough, if you want to put it that way, that that there wasn't people felt they had no input and in all these decisions were being made at a far distant capital by people that they didn't hadn't chosen and didn't know who they were. So I think there was a little bit of that. You know, it was done in that progressive rule by the experts kind of way. And I think that the question then is, you know, how does the public and I guess the, the real question is, you know, I, I see a lot of people who they're in favor of experts when the experts say the things they agree with. Right. Right. And provide yeah. the things they want. Right. Well, and that just what, but I mean, specifically, you know, uh, uh, one of my, the tropes I don't like on, on the right, and this will probably connect to some things that, that, that are of interest to you, is wh when somebody says, oh, when, when we're fighting a war, you know, we should just listen, the president should just listen to the generals. Well, the question is, which generals oh. should he listen to? You know, there are generals that say one thing and generals say another thing. What the president has to do is he has to decide, who am I going to listen to? Which experts do I pick? And what, what is it that I want? I mean, this is a big, a big, a, a serious gripe that I have with the public about this to say, well, during wartime, we should listen to the generals. Um, well, first, you, you know, we're a democracy. What is it you want? Why are you going to war in the first place? What is it you think you're going to achieve? And uh, I think, you know, the public and their political leaders get into a, a kind of, uh, dare I say, synergy uh, where, you know, it's going to we'll just do good things. You know, the public kind of puts forward this sort of generic commandment, go do good things with, without any reckoning of uh, how difficult that may be. Now, people in the military know how difficult it is and they know how dangerous it is, uh, but you can extend this to other national security issues. I mean, ask Americans whether they want a nuclear missile shield, right? Should we build, um, you know, uh, the back in the day, it shows you how old I am that I was going to say SDI. Uh, now Star Wars. Star Wars, right, you know, national missile defense. And people say, yes, of course. And then they say, okay, well, that's gonna be $100 billion a year. What are you willing to give up? And you get this kind of confused look of, but but I just want it, just do a good thing. Don't tell me that it has other costs. Um, and, and that gets really frustrating because then you get into a discussion like, do you know how much a billion, $100 billion is? Yeah. And the answer is no. Uh, so I, I think, you know, well, that, I think that applies I, well beyond military affairs too. It's a lot of legislation is like that. You know, we're going to, we're going to provide help, free health care. We're going to provide, uh, uh, you know, free. In, 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 we're yeah, going to provide, provide environmental protection. Gonna, you know, there, there's a lot of laws that are passed with the idea we have, you know, we're going to provide clean air and clean water. And you often put that in the name of the bill. Uh, but then when it comes to actually implementing I, I it, the, the healthy puppies and um, mom's apple pie bills. Right, right. I, I, I'm on record saying that that uh, all bills should just be called the really, really good bill that everyone should vote for act of 2018. Yeah. Um, and, and I but again, you know, the public. Um, be, I mean, this is where we are not a direct democracy. We're a republic and people you know, forget that a republic does rely not just on experts, but on elected officials, you know, exercising their own judgment. Mm -hmm. That there comes a time where elected officials should say, I understand what you're asking me to do, but that's either not possible, or it's not a good idea, or the cost would be too high. And I think we've really um, fallen into a notion that your elected officials in, in Washington or in your state capital, although interesting how rarely people even think about their state or local government. We just come accustomed to that, you know, that, that the imperial capital fixes everything. Uh, that, uh, that those representatives should just be megaphones who amplify the voice of the voters rather than have any input on it or to um, aggregate those interests 
or demands with those of other people in other places. Uh, and I think that, to go back to the book, uh, I think that's partly because we've been for 40 years, at least since the 60s, in the grip of a growing epidemic of narcissism, mm. that we don't really want to negotiate our political issues or the future of our country with other people. We just want what we want, and we don't want a lot of guff about it. We want a lot of emotional thinking and not a lot of rational thinking. And, and without, you know, in a very short time horizon, I want what I want. And, you know, as the, as the president said the other day, well, OK, so the deficit goes through the roof. I won't be around for it. Um, you know, that's somebody else's problem. Yeah. And I admit, I mean, I'm, you know, I've, I'm an American. I've fallen into that. <laughs> I mean, I, I have for most of my life thought of climate change, for example, as some problem that the MIT class of 2060 is going to solve. Um, you know, maybe that's that wasn't the best way to think about it. But that's a normal reaction to say, I want what I want and I want to offload the costs in that great Washington expression, the out years. Right. Right. The out years always means when I'm not here. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I think uh, that that we haven't really I think we've given up a lot of our civic virtue about compromise and thinking about future generations uh, in that, and it's made us that to bring this back to expertise. It's made us reject expertise because the real goal, the real task of an expert, is always to speak the truth, not just to power, but to your fellow citizens. And increasingly, you know, they nobody wants to hear it. Well, you talked. We've touched briefly on this earlier, but I want you to you, you trace this back to the 1960s. But what's the role of the rise of the internet in this? Is this sort of put jet fuel onto that? Absolutely. Uh, steroids. A absolutely. Um, and we should talk about the role of the right. I mean, I, you know, I still yeah, yeah. feel pretty good here. Um, two things happen in the 1980s into the 1990s, I would argue. One is the rise of the Internet, which creates the, the Internet does two things. It creates the illusion of knowledge because you can say, well, I watch the news or I read the Washington Post or I saw something, you know, authoritative. And what it really means is you clicked through a bunch of pretty images until you got to something that told you what you were already looking to hear. Or, or, uh, or we that, talked about medicine earlier, you know, the doctors complain about people going to Dr. Google and right. coming, with, coming in with a preconceived idea of they've diagnosed themselves, they've come up with, the, with what they think the remedy is going to be and that's what they want. And, and, you know, there are, the internet, let me just say, I am a tech, you know, you, you've known me for a long time. Yeah. I'm a I'm a technological, I'm a technophile. I mean, I was, you know, the guy building my own computer parts in the 1990s, and um, I, I was proudly showing off my 56K baud modem, you know, that was sitting at my desk making a racket. Uh, and, and the Internet can do great things. The problem is, if you go to the Mayo Clinic, right, the Mayo Clinic will say, here's a few things to think about, but in the end, call your doctor, especially if you feel dizzy or your chest mm -hmm. hurts or you're throwing up. Or they can go to Gwyneth Paltrow's site where she tells them to take mugwort steam and blow it up your hoo-hoo, <laughs> uh, you know, which gynecologists tell you not to do. Uh, and, and because those are all on the Internet, they all seem equally uh, authoritative. The other thing I would tell you um, uh, that, I, that I think uh, happened in the 80s and the 90s was as the academic left went down the off-ramp of postmodernism, the American right uh, went off and went down the hole both of evangelicalism, the notion that uh, if postmodernists say the text, you know, means what you think it means, the evangelicals come from a long tradition, uh, which is, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not an evangelical, mm. comes from a long tradition of saying the text means what God says it means. <sighs> As one of my friends likes to say, you know, it's like the, 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 all the red parts of the Bible, right? Where it's just a word of God and you don't need to think about it. Um, I, I'm, I'm Greek Orthodox. I come from a tradition that's quite opposite to that, which is that you need to study the Bible and have, you know, input from the church fathers and all that stuff. Um, but the other uh, problem with that is that it became almost like a proud opposition to the leftward drift of the universities. Mm -hmm. If intellectuals mm -hmm. said something, then rejecting it became a kind of, uh, declaration of Independence. Owning that, the libs. That, pardon? Owning the libs. Yeah, yeah. And, but also that you know, if it's if it's some guy with a PhD who teaches at Yale, um, whatever he's saying is ill and is not in my best interest. 
So whatever the truth is, is probably the opposite of whatever that guy from Yale is saying. And so you develop this other culture of knowledge as revealed knowledge, tied up with religion, and with a strong anti-intellectual streak that had always been in American cultural life, but now picked up this added fuel of people on the left are not just, uh, they're, that they're your enemies, that intellectuals are your enemies because they are increasingly identified with the left. So in terms of solving the problem, I think a huge key to it is people have to understand how it is to pick experts, who, how it is to recognize who's a real expert and who's not a real expert. I mean, that's, and that's, a, that's a really tricky question. Yes. Uh, and, you know, this is partly, uh, I think, one other thing that happened in the American right was the rise of the 24-7 news cycle and the notion that now with talk radio and uh, Fox, that there was this kind of truth telling platform and the people there were the real experts as opposed to other places. Uh, but one thing that's common to the right and left in this new era of anti-expertise is expert shopping. Yeah. And going and finding the people uh, that you know you that are going to tell you what you want to know. The the other thing I would say that is well, nonpartisan. If, if I could interrupt sorry, on, I, on that, because uh, one of the things you talked about climate change, and, and one of the pet peeves I have on climate change is that you know the the people who are, are in favor of you know the global warming and global warming regulations tend to say we're on the side of the experts, and you know that is the consensus in the field. But at the same time, I find things like the New York Times has this policy of not talking to people who are experts, who are climate scientists, who are at all skeptical of of those claims. So like Richard Lindzen or I, Judith Curry. So, again, it's that expert shopping kind of thing. It's like our experts are good and your experts are bad. Well, there's also a problem here in the difference between empirical and normative conclusions. Yes, uh, I, I think. Um, you know, I, about a year or so ago, I gave a talk to a group at the National Academy of Sciences at, where mostly, I mean, let's, you know, let's face it, I was on their side, <laughs> you know, National Academy of Sciences, you guys need to get out there and talk to the public. Uh, but one thing I did say to my, you know, science colleagues uh, was you don't get very far by saying that because the science empirically says something, that therefore all the normative conclusions come right from that. Right. Um, one line I put in the book, and I don't talk about climate science very much in the book because I'm just so exhausted by that subject. <laughs> uh, but I say, you know, it's it's you can argue over the morality and wisdom of letting Boston slide into the harbor in 50 years. The bigger question is, do people understand that that's the choice they're making? Because then it becomes a matter of choice. It becomes a matter of policy. And I think what the climate folks, I think both sides do something terrible here. The people, the, the climate science folks who I think the facts are on their side about what is happening, say that because this is happening, you must accept all of our prescriptions t in toto and without argument, which is not the way policy works. The people on the right say, because I don't like those policy prescriptions, the only way to really fight against this is to reject the science all the way right back up the line. Uh, and to just say that none of it is true, which is equally, I, I would say, even more stupid. Uh, because, but it's very effective. It's a way of undermining the debate right at the level of protons and neutrons. Um, and as a result, nobody gets anything done, and they just shout at each other. Uh, one side saying you must do what I say, and the other side saying nothing you're saying is true. Right now, I'm I'm more, I'm a skeptic on global warming, but it's because I'm not convinced by the science. But I've also made an effort to delve into that and educate myself. And I think that's a major issue behind this, which is the public's need to educate themselves beyond the level of, hey, I did a Google search. Right. And, and I think, you know, it's, it, you can't really argue with a consensus that says the climate is changing. Right. Beyond that, <laughs> you can get into different opinions among as experts. Why is the climate changing? How fast is it changing? How much uh, is this um, because of man-made right. uh, change as opposed to ethical change? And even the scientists, I think, more quietly, if, if you talk to them out away from this shouting and the screaming, they'll say, you know, our, our findings are probabilistic. We have some disagreements within ourselves about what this means. But I think one, one problem here, and my, my, here my sympathies are with the scientists, they are hesitant to say, to put these caveats out there, because the anti-expert 
uh, folks jump on that as proof that they don't know what they're talking about. If they say, look, my model is not 100%, it might be 90%. And then, to bring in yet another movie reference, everybody becomes like Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber, and they nod and they say, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> you know, chances this isn't going to happen. Well, one in a million. So you're saying there's a chance. Okay. Uh, and people jump on it and say, well, it's not 100%, therefore you don't know what you're talking about. And I think scientists are very reluctant to wade into that, in part because the public is not going to be equipped for that debate. Um, it's like when people, to bring this back to medicine for a moment, I had somebody at a talk saying to me, well, you know, why should I, why, why do I have to take the word of my doctor on things? The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, or, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, they're online and I can read them. And I said to him, they're not written for you. You, you, you don't have of the background to understand it's like me reading you know the journal of architectural engineering and then explaining to people how to build houses I, i'm not equipped to read those articles because i didn't that's not my background uh and it, it, i think that's one of the reasons i wrote the book i just became frustrated by you know the guy who says well i read an article in, i read a, a journal article in the lancet well it did, you know um What's the line from a Fish Called Wanda? You know, apes don't read philosophy. Yes, they do. They just don't understand it. <laughs> uh, and and I think people have just gotten way over their skis about, well, I read something and therefore I know what I'm talking about. I, I had a guy who wanted me to put something into the curriculum uh, at the Naval War College some years ago. I mentioned this this in the book, and he said, I said, what background do you have in this thing you wrote? Um, and he said none. But he said, you read a book a month, it makes you an expert, right? And I said, no. And he was really kind of put out about it. Yeah. Well, so what do you see, what do you propose as the solution here in terms of what people need to do to avoid this problem of, ignore, of, of trying to ignore or disparage the expert advice? How do people actually use that to make political decisions without just abdicating to, oh, here, let's hand everything over to the experts? Well, I have two recommendations. One of them is a small bore ex explanation uh, about something you can do immediately, which is when you see an expert um, you know, one place Google can help you is that if you see a talking head on television, um, find out who they are. Um, my entire CV is posted on the internet. Anybody who wants to know any place I've ever worked, where I got my education, all the stuff I've ever written, it's it's all right there. I, I, I'm, I make a real effort here to be transparent and to just post it. Um, and that, you know, that should... I think that would solve a lot of problems because there are people where I've gone and looked them up. I've I've seen somebody on a you know sitting there watching one of the talking head shows, and I said I've never seen this person, uh, and I find out sometimes I find out this is somebody who really does have you know pretty good chops about what they do, and other times I find out that it's part of the problem with the 24 hours. I started to say this earlier. It's part of the problem with the 24 hour news cycle. It's clearly somebody that's just dragoon, dragooned in to fill a seat. Um, you know, somebody who got out of college two years ago and is explaining the intricacies of Saudi Arabian politics uh, with absolutely, you know, who a year before was writing for, you know, and it was an intern for an Internet magazine. Right. Um, that That's one thing you can do is to say, look, what what is the background of the person I'm listening to? A lot of times when I'm reading an article, I will skip to the bottom to read the bio line. Like before I'm going to wade through this 3000 words, is this a person who you know has some background in this, or you know, do, should I take this walk with this writer? The larger bore. This is going to sound really strange coming from somebody as annoyingly arrogant as I can be, um, but I think the larger bore recommendation I have is for people to be a little more humble and to treat each other with a better, um, with more, in um, uh, good faith. Hmm. You know, don't assume that everybody, I mean, I it may, nothing breaks my heart more than when I'm doing talks like this, you know, in the places where I've gone and talked about the book. And it's inevitably somebody, so everybody lies, you know, everybody's just lying. They're all, everybody's in cahoots with everybody and everybody's just ripping us off. It's like, you know, you can't live that way. I mean, that's not even true in bad regimes, never mind the United States or Great Britain or Japan or Canada. Um, you know, even in the old Soviet Union, there were people that tried to do, you know, tried to build roads and do it well. Um, you know, Soviet air controllers did not want plane crashes. They did their best. Um, 
and I think we really have to get away from that kind of churlish, childish kind of assumption that everybody in the world is bad but me. And, and I, I, I think if we just take a little more good faith in these discussions, we could probably get a lot further. My guest is Tom Nichols, uh, author of The Death of Expertise. I'm Rob Trzynski. This is Salon of the Refused. You can find more commentary and analysis at the Trzynski Letter, trzynskiletter.com. Uh, you can like our, our or subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to my podcast, uh, and you can uh, support us at Patreon, patreon.com slash Salon of the Refused.